Uh, Alex, uh, thank you so much for doing this interview. I, I really enjoyed this movie as I usually enjoy most of your documentaries. I could imagine when you, thank you. took on this subject that there was a lot to consider. Uh, it's a big, big topic. And I was wondering how you went about deciding what the focus would be. I mean, there's, there's the history in the film, there's the, the problems, there's some good things in there. Yeah, it was, it's a giant subject, obviously. Um, thankfully, usually with these projects um, that are so big topic, topically, uh, we have a specific story that we want to tell or that we end up focusing in on. And that becomes kind of our, our parameters. Parameters are your friend uh, <laughs> when you're making documentaries and you can go on forever. Um, and that was obviously the case in Point with Zappa, which we talked about. Similarly, uh, where you know all this media, all this life, how do you carve that into a story? And and it was not funnily enough dissimilar for YouTube, despite it being a tech story, because um, you know I'd made several tech documentaries leading up to this one about very specific things, uh, usually about the evolution of online communities, and that's what interests me the most about technology is people um, and how technology brings people together and divides people. Uh, and YouTube is really the preeminent story about that uh, of our time. Uh, more than any other platform, more than any other technology, uh, YouTube and Google, which is the parent company, I mean, AB Alphabet's the parent company, but YouTube is, is owned and run by Google, um, is just by far the largest media uh, company on the planet, by far, by far, by far. So we're talking about not only the largest media company, but also the largest online based community that not only brings people together in, in real time, but also uh, has stored within its data um, almost all of the media in recorded history, right? <laughs> which is kind of unfathomable when you think about it. So when you know people think of, of YouTube as, oh, you know, you could make a movie about influencers or you could make a movie about like the rise of the internet or you could make a movie about like how cool DIY videos are. Uh, thankfully, none of those things interested us that much. So uh, we were able to kind of, you know, clear all that away and focus in on, on the story that, that mattered to us. Well, one idea that keeps on coming up throughout the film is that uh, YouTube just keeps on growing. Yeah, you know, throughout the film, you give different years and, and what the, the number of users was, and then it just keeps on getting bigger and bigger. And it, it's strange because when you look at other forms of media, it seems like all the other forms of media at some point sort of reached their peak, but mm -hmm. it's not happening yet anyhow with YouTube. Uh, why is that so significant? Uh, there's a couple of reasons why its growth is significant. Uh, one is, is the whole idea of scale, uh, which is really what matters most in technology. What, what made Napster Napster, which was the very first tech doc that I made, was the fact that it scaled. It was not the first time that people had created an online based community through a central database, which is really what Napster did that was seminal, nor was it the first time that people traded MP3s and other crude forms of sound and other media through the Internet. It was the first time that that, that it scaled um, Facebook, the first time that scaled Spotify, the first time that scaled it, the, the technology that matters is the technology that scales. It's the technology that catches fire with the entire global population. Uh, and, and captures them. And YouTube uh, not only has scaled, but the, the sort of to the point you raised at the beginning, its uses are so broad that there's really no reason why it will stop scaling uh, necessarily. I'm sure that's music to the ears of their stockholders, right? <laughs> but, um, but it's captured you know, the attention of billions of people on this planet. Uh, and there are tens of billions of views every day. And there's billions of hours of content being uploaded to YouTube and, and consumed, uh, viewed on YouTube all the time. So that's part of it. The other thing which we focused on in the movie was, was the historical perspective, which was that, that the pandemic and the election uh, of 2016 and its aftermath sort of culminating in the insurrection on January 6th, for now, for our purposes of our film, because Lord knows none of this stuff is over. Uh, that was very good to YouTube. Um, insurrection is good for business, for, for a platform, for an ad-based platform like YouTube. A pandemic is very, very good for business, for uh, a, a platform that allows people to connect when they're at home, uh, at a time when nobody was able to go uh, to school, to the office, to, to work. 
uh, really to leave their house. Uh, the, the numbers on YouTube in that period exploded. In fact, there were a lot of articles in the last year saying, oh, YouTube has lost its luster because its numbers came down. But the numbers were, were in a way artificially heightened by those, those factors. And that will happen again, that you know, more issues on the planet that drive people uh, in that way, uh, political unrest, um, you know, issues that, that force people home, climate change, more pandemics, whatever. All of those things are good for a, a platform that relies on you to be staring into your computer screen. Alex, I want to get into some of the serious concerns that you raise in the film, but you do take a little bit of time to uh, remind us that there are some benefits to YouTube. Uh, in, in your opinion, you don't have to go through all of them. What are some of the best things that YouTube can do? Well, I, I would go further and say that I think, you know, because you're watching a movie and a movie has a narrative drive, it, it can feel that we're sort of paying some lip service to some positives and then diving into negatives. But I think that, that it's important to state that, that you know, I'm not anti-YouTube or anti-Google. I think the Google has done enormous good on the planet and uh, as a company has issues, absolutely. But it's also uh, taken enormous pains to try and, uh, uh, and create uh, solutions to problems that have, that have erupted within a, a, a massive growth spurt that nobody could really wrap their arms around that well. YouTube has really done enormous good um, on the planet in, in, in innumerable ways. Education, uh, it's ability, I mean, it's spread far more positive COVID and other medical information than it did negative and misinformation, which was, I mean, we lived on YouTube during the pandemic. It saved our butts. Uh, but it also has done much more than that. It's really like our library, Alexandria. I mean, it really is the, the nexus point of all historical media. I think that's really hard to overstate. Um, I think there's nothing like that that's ever existed in human history. And I find that might I mean anything you wanna see is 100% out of your fingertips, no matter where in the world you are provided, I mean, not everyone in the world has access to a computer, but many, many people do of all economic strata. The other thing that they do and have done that I think is very, very important to recognize is I think they were at the forefront of driving this sort of global diversity push that we now see, especially within the entertainment industry. Um, long before the film and TV business was diversifying, and I still think they're a long way from doing that properly, women, people of color, et cetera. Um, YouTube had, had just yanked the gates down and the walls down and you had trans and people of color and you had superstars in like small African countries. And it didn't matter who you were or where you were, you had an audience and you could actually make a living and gain traction. Uh, and I think that changed the world. I think that changed the way we thought of what was acceptable as a thought leader, a celebrity, uh, an expert. Um, and I, I think that that's also hard to, to um, to grasp for a lot of people because it was such a giant sea change and it ended up affecting other things. Obviously, you know, we're making a movie and we have very specific aims with that movie. And it was to us, it was very important to state the things that we didn't feel were obvious and didn't feel were being spoken about enough. And to give context to uh, both the positive side of that, of that in, uh, cultural impact, but really very closely uh, scrutinize the negative as well. Well, one of the negatives that you really kind of delve into is that a huge percentage of the videos that are on YouTube uh, are delivering material that interests conspiracy theorists uh, or the alt-right. Um, can you go into a little bit um, about why this is such a concern of yours? And, and, and are the numbers really that large? I, I was kind of shocked. I think you said in the, in, in the movie, that around 10% of the videos uh, fall into that category? Yeah, and especially at the time of, that the recommender algorithm was firing on all cylinders, it's, it's been tinkered with. Though, as we talk about in the film, there's a kind of over-reliance on this idea of an algorithm as a kind of a catch-all term and then sort of a something that you could just turn off to fix a problem. Um, and algor the, the word algorithm is extremely broad um, and doesn't really mean a whole lot in terms of, of uh, the, the, the issues at play. Uh, it has an impact for sure. It matters, absolutely. There are very big AI people that came out of Google that have blown the whistle on, on problems with the algorithm. Um, though AI is another term that I think gets used way too broadly and has, is, almost means nothing at this point uh, in our culture. Um, the impact of, of the propaganda, the conspiracy theories, the disinformation, 
um, the intentional misinformation, uh, the proliferation of those things have been a problem for a very long time. They've been a problem really uh, for over 10 years on YouTube. And many of us have seen that. There are many journalists who have been trying to uh, raise greater awareness about these issues. There have been focus groups and other task force groups put together even within Google, as Brianna Wu talks about in our film. <laughs> but they have done very little. And uh, I think for me, uh, personally, the Christchurch shooting was kind of a watershed moment where all of these things that people had been warning about, uh, if you keep allowing the proliferation of this kind of uh, uh, propaganda and hate speech and uh, things that people were saying, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, it's just speech, it's not violence, it's, it's was that there will be violence. This will culminate in actual death. Um, and Christchurch was an irrefutable example of that where the shooter himself absolutely uh, credited YouTube with his radicalization in very, very specific terms down to the influencers that he was absorbing on YouTube and what they were saying that had motivated him. Now, this has happened over and over again since Christchurch, uh, and very little has been done. So I think that, that by the time we got to the January 6th insurrection, um, and the studies had shown, the Bellingcat study is excellent, which shows how the majority of uh, far-right insurrectionists were radicalized on YouTube, not just on technology, but on YouTube itself. Uh, I think that it was, it was, uh, it was past the time when the red flags had been, had been raised. It was past the time when everyone had said, look, you guys have to do something about this. Now we're sort of like in what Anthony Padilla in the film calls, you know, a digital intersection with constant car crashes and no traffic lights. Uh, and so that's why I thought it was very important to just slow down and spend a lot of time picking apart why this is significant. I think with some of the examples that you gave, uh, one can really easily see your point. I am curious, though, as a documentary filmmaker and, and probably someone I assume that believes in free speech, um, that it, it can be a slippery slope when when it starts to come up with solutions, which I, I know you don't really um, come up with an exact solution in the film. Um, but for example, you know, I mean, obviously there are certain things that are posted on YouTube that are just wrong. Um, now the term is disinformation that everyone's using and, and that's brought up in the film. Um, but not all conspiracies are necessarily bad. Um, one of my favorite films that you, you did um, has to do with the Panama Papers. And it's not exactly a conspiracy, but it's sort of a conspiracy where the elites are finding places to hide their money and keep them away from being taxed uh, by governments and and so on. Um, a story like that might not be able to be told if, if all these different stories were censored. And I'm not saying that you're saying that they should be censored, but where does one draw the line in terms of like what should be allowed on YouTube and what shouldn't be allowed? And should it be the government like we're talking about now, um, every day in the news, there's information about like um, uh, the, the, the government coming up with a, a disinformation board that should decide over these private companies whether certain things should be on there or not. It's a complicated issue. It is. Um, you, you've asked several key questions in there, so I'm going to try to unpack them one by one. The first one is, what is a conspiracy theory? Conspiracy, uh, the Panama Papers is not a conspiracy theory. Um, a conspiracy theory is a theory that is not rooted in fact. The Panama right. Papers is a very mundane fact. A company in Panama called Masek Fonseca was the, the harbor of a, a large organization that was allowing offshore accounts and other uh, transactions that did not require uh, to be identified. There's nothing conspiratorial about that. That's that as, as plain as the nose on my face. That is literally a fact, and that's what happened, and the journalists discovered it and it was uncovered, the end. No conspiracy, no conspiracy theory there. Um, the, the earth, for instance, is not flat, it's round, right? <laughs> We've known that for a while. So if, if uh, so over there, you've got round earth, you have the Panama Papers, but these are just facts, they just happen, it's fine, nothing to worry about. Over here, you have the earth is, is flat um, and uh, ivermectin will, will solve your COVID, right? Those are not facts, those are anti-facts, those are in fact lies. Um, they're usually there to serve a purpose. Uh, they either corral a group of people so that they can be manipulated, which I think the flat earth theory falls under, or in the case of ivermectin, it was mostly snake oil by grifters who wanted to make money by selling you stuff that wasn't going to do anything, but was going to make them very rich. Uh, so I think that 
that's part of the issue I have with sort of, and I'm not saying you're doing this at all, but I'm saying that's part of the issue I have with the sort of both sides is um, what about is culture we live in today, where if you come out and say, well, don't say that the earth is flat, they're saying, oh, well, you're biased. I mean, against what? I'm biased against your, your idiocy. <laughs> Can we start there? Like 100%, I am biased against your idiocy. I make no claims against that. Um, so I think it is important. Uh, you know, I have three boys. They've all grown up on YouTube. I've had no problem with them getting rabbit holed. Now, some of that is their own intelligence. Some of that is our, is our oversight as parents. But the fact is, is my kids are pretty good at going, well, that's dumb because that's obviously not true, right? Uh, I think that the culture we live in right now, which is giving far too much safe harbor to gray, what are called grays, um, isn't doing anyone any favors because it's really not very difficult to ferret out the fact from the fiction as an individual. So we have to ask ourselves, why are people being propagandized? What, what is the power behind these platforms that is so good at shifting somebody's worldview from X to Y? Um, what, is, what are their weaknesses and vulnerabilities and what is the motivation or incentives of those platforms? And that's the thing that we get into with this film and that gets into parasocial relationships. It gets into the advertising incentive of YouTube where unfortunately they make more money if you're watching the content. So it doesn't matter to them whether the content is pumping ivermectin horse paste or telling you how to properly get COVID help they still get the ad revenue, right? So they're gonna keep pumping that stuff. They're incentivized, not by truth, but by engagement, uh, which leads in a way um, as elegantly as I could possibly do to your last question, which is now what do we do? Um, and the film obviously doesn't provide a solution in terms of content moderation or uh, um, exactly how to flip the switches to turn off misinformation because that is complicated. But I would also, but we do make, some pretty concrete um, statements about how we think things should go in terms of dealing with these tech companies, uh, which frankly is to break them up. And I, I don't really see any other solution. I think it's, we're living in, in a very fast moving era, the technological era um, uh, revolution, which is even faster paced and more seismic than the industrial revolution. And the only way we were able to deal with the industrial revolution was to break these companies up, right? We did that with U.S. Steel. We did it with tobacco. We did it with with char with uh, trains. We did it with coal, um, and we did it to a degree with the automotive industry. And there's no doubt in my mind we we're going to do that with big tech. There's no doubt, and I'm sure there's no doubt in big tech's mind, which is why they're trying to make as much money as they possibly can as fast as they can, just like the fossil fuel industry before the salad days are over. I don't see any other way around it. I think when you hear, if, if someone like you or someone like me says, well, it's not that easy to police speech, I believe it. Like when you said it, like, I'm like, yeah, that's right. I believe you. I agree with you. Uh, when a big tech person says that, an alarm bell goes off in my head. I'm, I'm being gaslit, right? Because that's what they, they don't want us to be looking for solutions. They want right. to keep throwing hurdles into the road and say, hey, well, if you abolish Section 230, then the internet's going to shut down. There's truth there. Like, oh, if we if we tried to police all the videos, then there'll be no videos on YouTube. Uh, no, I don't believe that's true. There's no way to do content moderation. No, I'm sorry, I don't believe that either. Um, it's not my job to police somebody's company. It's their job to police it. And if they don't police it, then yes, as a citizen through government, it absolutely is my job to break them up. And that's kind of the way I look at it. And if they were broken up, would it solve the problems that are brought up in the film uh, in terms of all the different issues sure, that are not, raised? Not, yeah, sure, not easily. But what the, the problem right now is that you have one company, as you said at the very beginning of this, that does all these things, right? right. So, and that company's making a lot of money because they do all these things. That company's not incentivized to not do all these things. But if there were many, many companies that did a lot less things, it would be significantly easier to drill down into each one of those companies in terms of how they function. We, we've done that very successfully as a society in the past, historically. Is it easy? No. Is it fun? No. Is it profitable, as profitable for those companies? No, which is why they're never going to do that to themselves, right? Uh, but we did that with broadcast television very successfully, I might add. We don't even think about S&P these days. It just kind of happens. We did that with the automotive industry, which they went kicking and screaming, but eventually... I mean, geez, 
you know, I was looking at all of the anti-vaxxers we have. I was thinking like, I don't think those people get in their car and refuse to wear their seatbelt, right? They don't even think about it, right? But I grew up in an era when you didn't wear your seatbelt. Like this all happened during my lifetime. I, I'm a motorcycle rider. I remember everyone kicking and screaming about the helmet laws. Now everybody wears a helmet. And if you're in Florida where they don't, you sort of like do one of these as they drive past you. Um, so it's, we, we do, we comply all the time. We, we break things up all the time. We, we do the hard work of, of making things safer for our citizens all the time. And if our entire population is moving online, which they have, and there's no turning that around, as some people suggest we should do, it's not gonna happen, it's too late. Um, we have to keep those people safe. So guess what? Yeah, it's hard and we got to figure it out. To go back to the Panama Papers, um, at some point in, in, in the story, I, I'm sure that when people were raising the issue and it wasn't accepted as fact, I agree with you, it is a fact and there's a world of difference. I don't mean to like lump Panama Papers in with Flat Earth. I know there's a huge difference, but there are certain stories that powerful corporations or powerful government figures will just say it's not true to protect their own interests. And, and sure, journalists like though. yourself will, yeah. will, will, will first put out a theory and then try to prove it and then it becomes fact. And, and that, you, you know, you're answering your own question though, because, because it is on the onus of the whistleblower to provide fact to back up their theory. That's the, the you know, the onus was on, was on Ellsberg. The onus was on on Woodward and Bernstein. The onus was on uh, Snowden. Like, if you're right. going to come forward and make a and make a bold statement, and, and that was to you know to your point, that was what my whole doc on panel papers was about. Was you had Frederick and Bastian in Germany, these sort of lower level journalists at Süddeutsche Zeitung, get the story of the century dumped in their lap. Like, who the hell is going to believe us? Or, or if they do, they're just going to shoot us in our sleep. And the onus became on them to do all this work. To, to, to show their work, to convince the public that it was fact. I mean, that's, that's the job of any journalist or any truth teller or whatever. I don't, I don't really see that as being the same issue here because YouTube is not, you know, these tech pl platforms are not the only outlet for information. They're just an outlet for information. Right. So you think it's just better for uh, people creating content that delve into these kind of controversial issues to wait until they have the goods before they go public? To have the evidence first, I, you couldn't theorize first. Ideal. I mean, I mean, people can do whatever they want, but they shouldn't. They can't expect people to move it from the conspiracy theory bucket to the fact bucket until they've shown their labor. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. I mean, I like look. I, I'm a, a you know, in a, I'm a big believer in sort of the discernment of of uh, of information. But the problem is, if you look at the Christchurch shooter, the people that he was saying was motivating him to kill these people were not. The kinds of people you're talking about we're not the kinds yeah. of people who are like had, had who are like pulling on the the sort of threads of like what is at the root of capitalism or or you know what are the problems of neoliberalism or what are like you know legitimate kind of inquiry about the way of the world that could veer onto the edgier side of that kind of inquiry no this was like stefan molyneux who's a white supremacist who was <laughs> telling telling people that you know they were going to get replaced by jews and black people and we should kill them and muslims right. i mean it wasn't it wasn't the gray end of of inquiry it was it was sure. flat out hate speech and as we talk about in the movie it's usually funded by very high powered entities whether it's the Koch brothers or big you know organizations yeah. like fox or whatever um I don't think there's much danger in terms of what you're talking about. And I think in fact that the internet will always be a great place for that kind of uh, sort of on the edge inquiry. I've been in that space since the eighties. I got online during the DBS Usenet era and I got online exactly for what you're talking about. I got online yeah. because that's where I could engage with people who were talking about really interesting ideas. But at no point in there did I listen to someone make thinly veiled racist arguments for the, you know, the supremacy of the white race and think, oh, that's an interesting point of view. You know? yeah. So, you know, these, the, it's, that's why I talk about my children, right? Like you have to have your own ability to discern these things. If you don't, you're either a lunatic on your way to shooting somebody in a mosque, right? right. Or you're very vulnerable to getting rabbit hole. Do, do you think, I know your film centers on just YouTube and, and you touch on Google as well. Um, but what about things like 
uh, just on the internet in general, like pornography and, and, and things of that nature. I mean, you've touched on so many different topics in, in the movies that you've made. Um, I mean, it, it, if one thing is dangerous on YouTube, I mean, do you, do you think we have to be careful with all these different kinds of subjects on on the internet? I think you do for your children. I think it's very it's it's broadcast, so it's similar to your TV, right? Um, these are these are issues that came up when when cable hit um, in the '80s, and then in, in very predominantly in the '90s, when suddenly everything was on your TV when it hadn't been at all. Uh, TV was very, as we all know, we all grew up in it. It was very, very crude and uh, narrow. The, the the content was very narrow, and things were usually chopped up. I mean, a, a racy PG movie was chopped to ri ribbons before they put it on TV, right? Um, yeah. And then suddenly you had everything. Like cable TV just hit, and overnight it was all there. You had to like, oh my god, what are we going to do with the kids? And what are we going to do with our, you know, um, the people in our household? Uh, I think that the the internet is a is a window into the entire world for good and ill, uh, so it requires discernment on the part of the viewer. Um, but it really does require accountability and responsibility on the part of the of the the broadcaster, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, and there's really no way around that for them to just throw up their hands and say, "Hey, we're going to have an advertising model, so we're going to make money out of all this stuff, but we have no responsibility for any of it." I mean, that's, that doesn't make any sense to me ethically. It doesn't mean that solutions are easy. It doesn't mean you want to start turning off the internet, but it does mean that the conversation has to change. And right now that's the problem I have is that we're not asking for this kind of all or nothing world we live in where, where if you raise these questions like, oh, well, you're trying to turn the internet off. And again, I'm not saying you're saying that. Yeah. This is the other side that is usually right. saying that. It's like, no, we want to have a conversation. We, we were nowhere near breaking up big tech. No way, we're decades away. They Big tech controls the left side of the government and the right. No one's going anywhere near them with legislation or antitrust because they have locked up the hill, right? For the foreseeable future, they own it. Uh, so no one is suggesting that they're going to get broken up tomorrow. But we have to start having much more intelligent and nuanced conversations. And I think that the conversation right now, which tech has been very good about hoodwinking, the uh, driving the narrative, the predominant conversation right now is that it's on the end user, like that it's a dilemma of like, oh, do we go on social media or not? Or do we just turn off our devices? Like that is the most disingenuous argument <laughs> because we're all on these, look at how we're talking to each other right, right now. <laughs> we live in the digital space today. There's, sure. There is no turning it off and going outside. That ship sailed 25 years ago and the tech companies know that in their bones and they're hoodwinking you if, if they've gotten you to think that this is somehow you, your fault or your child's fault, like, oh, my kid is on an iPad too much. It's like, yeah, they're probably learning and like connected to their friends. And most of what they're doing there is, is essential and is not going to go away. And if you take it away from them, they will sure as hell find a way to do it that you don't know about because where their, their whole world exists. So the narrative has to change. The narrative has to put the onus and the accountability back where it really belongs, which is with the companies that are profiting off of all of this. Well, you make some very good points there. And uh, you show some great examples in the film of people who are fighting back and uh, trying to get some, some new legislation passed. Um, if, if there was one thing uh, that the people watching this film that you would recommend that they go out and do to, to make some of the stuff that you were talking about today happen, what, what could people do? I mean, I'm not being glib when I say that if you genuinely care about these issues, you need to get online, not get offline. You need to get online. You need to understand what is Section 230. What is it? Do you know? Right? Do you know why it's tricky to, to just turn it off? Like, do, I'm not mean you. I just mean yeah, 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 all of us. I, me too. It's, it's complicated <laughs> as hell, right? You know, do we know what Section 230 is? Do we know what, what the relationship is of Google and YouTube and Facebook? Um, Twitter's a mess right now, but in general, like the big three or four companies, you know, what are they doing? You know, who is financing them? What are their long-term goals, right? Uh, what is the implementation implementation of what they're doing? What are the good things that they're doing, right? Not all the negative. You know, to me, if you want to respond to the things that scare you about the culture that we live in, you have to be in involved in that culture. You have to be engaged with it. It's very, very hard to do anything if the, if the response is, I'm just not going to, I'm going to ignore it, I'm anti-tech, right? That's like, 
that's like literally being pro horse anti car, which I'm sure, you know, maybe I would have been like that too, but boy, was the world going to take off without you. So you're not going to be part of the solution if that's your mindset. Um, so I highly recommend to people that they do more, re I mean, don't do it online if you don't like the internet, but do more reading, like learn about what's going on. Learn about what is the lobbying power of Google and YouTube and Facebook uh, or Meta, whatever it's called this week. Um, <laughs> What is what is the significance of Elon Musk taking over Twitter on a political level? Who's financing that takeover? What are the motives for that takeover? This is the news, right? And and this news will Im impact you politically and and socially. So, I mean, to to for me, I tell people to to get involved and to get online and to be aware of how these platforms work and to engage with these platforms if you can. Well, Alex, you give us a lot to think about um, in your in your movie and. Uh... Also, from our discussion today, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I found this fascinating and a uh, great, great. Yeah, movie. thanks, man. I love talking to you. I always love being here. I look forward to being back physically again. So I appreciate having the film here. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks.